get Mr. Echidna's summary about episode 18 when Pandora showed up. The final boss of ReZero, really. The final boss is not Satala, because we know that Satala seemingly is a good person. And the Witch of Envy is like a split personality due to the incompatibility of some sort of which factor or plural, but Pandora is the true final boss? Let's see it. When ReZero Season 2 was first announced, this episode is the one I was most excited for. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the lolly we've all been waiting for, Pandora, ReZero's 8th witch, has finally been introduced, and I- And will there be a ninth witch if we go according to the, uh, the lore of, like, you know, Witch of Vanity and Witch of Melancholy existing before like the seven original sins, which is like, you know, like gluttony, sloth, pride, envy, uh, sloth, you know. I can already smell the hentai. If only one clip could represent my feelings about this week's episode, it would be this. 10 out of 10. For anyone that's confused about why there's eight witches of sin, but only seven deadly sins, vainglory. <laughs> my favorite frame, bro. Only seven deadly sins. Wait, wait, wait. Deadly sins, vain yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, fuck. Seven deadly frames, bro. I still can't believe this is a real frame. I cannot believe this is a real fucking scene from Seven Deadly Sins, the final season, right? Like, that's crazy. Like, this girl looks kind of okay, I guess. But what the fuck is happening here? What? How could you possibly let this happen? That's crazy, bro. Vainglory or vanity was historically included as an official sin, okay. although it was later removed. We finally, although it was as an official sin. Let's see, this is an unjustified boasting. Pope Gregory viewed it as a form of pride, so he folded vainglory into pride for his listing sins. So, huh. Wonder if there's gonna be like a, like a pope. I mean, so far there's witches and archbishops. Is there a pope? I don't know, but a, a long time ago, the pope, you know, Gregory just said, Ah, vainglory, vanity. That's pretty much pride, so you can just become pride. According to Aquinas, it is the progenitor of envy? Hold up. He folded vainglory into pride in church lore, but Aquinas, who the fuck is Aquinas? Wait, 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 this is kind of crazy, right? Aquinas? What the hell are you, what's, what's an Aquinas? Thomas Aquinas. He is a doctor of the church. Catholic church's greatest theology and philosophy. Sure. And a progenitor is something that comes right before, right? A progenitor, right? A person or thing from which a person, animal, or plant is Descendant or originate, right? And answers or oh wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. A parent or direct ancestor of a person, animal, or plant. So uh, <laughs> you're not saying that. <laughs> you're not telling me that the witch of vainglory or vanity is the mother of witch of envy. I don't think there's a direct mother daughter situation, but it sounds like. Thematically, if, if, if there is any easter eggs here to be had, and if Tapi has incorporated this lore into the show, like... The Witch of Envy, the Witch of Vainglory, makes you think. Sin, although it was later removed. We finally got the reason behind the Betelgeuse glow up challenge, as well as the origins glow up of challenge. his name. What you can learn from a quick Google search is that Alpha Betelgeuse Orionis. is the name of a star in the Orion constellation. As yep. you can see, it's right at the beginning of the dude's arm, which may be a reference to Aldebaran, right over here. Remember, this is Al. Aldebaran. To the unseen hand. Also, Sirius. This is another one too, right? This is another important one, right? This, this fucking name. A kid that literally fucking meme with this name. So Sirius, Aldebaran, Orion, right? Betelgeuse, right over here. But before this episode, his name wasn't Betelgeuse. It was Juice. Juice Romani Conti. Des. It wasn't until he decided to absorb the sloth factor that Pandora granted him the name Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse. However, Betelgeuse is a star from our universe and it was named by someone from Earth. So mm -hmm. how did Pandora know to call him that? Because the fucking basketball, bro. Basketball. <laughs> um, cause like, remember the constellations videos? We watched the constellation videos, right? And there's a lot of like the naming schemes of constellations and characters and lore having to be with there, right? Subaru is supposed to be Pleiades, and that's supposed to be like the uniter, right? Six stars in the fucking Subaru logo to imply that he's gonna collect all six witch factors. I don't really know. But beyond that, the world of ReZero doesn't have the same level of constellations. And Pandora referring to this implies that she knows beyond the Great Waterfall due to the seal. Is that what's happening? Is she the one that grabbed the fucking basketball, bro? 
I don't know. I thought that maybe Hoshin of the Wilderness is the reason for the basketball, but maybe it's not. Maybe this fucking seal... I don't know. I feel like the seal... Like, again, now that we know that the true seal of Satella resides in, like, um, a deserty place, I thought, like, okay, so what is this seal? It's a seal. If you unlock it, it's a portal to the Witch of MB's actual seal. That's pretty troll. I would love it if this portal goes to a different world, though. You might have been able to convince me it was just a coincidence if there wasn't already an abundance of ReZero characters, including Subaru, that are mm -hmm. named after other stars and yep. constellations. In fact, just in the image I'm showing you right Aldebaran, now, I can Sirius, see the names Rigel, Rigel, literally Subaru's like a uh, son, right? There's also Spica, who is the daughter in the in the uh, sloth route where you know Rem and Subaru are family. There's Sirius here, which is another important name that fucking Echidna was memeing with, right? There's another one over here that I can't really see, actually, because of Kona Nebula. Cone Nebula? I don't know. But Aldebaran, Al. ...of four characters from ReZero. And in case you're wondering, Subaru is the Japanese name for the star cluster Pleiades, which means... Oh, it's also the Seven Sister? That's hilarious. ...means Seven Sisters. Real subtle to pay. Yeah, real subtle. And it literally means Uniter. One of whom tradition says is invisible, hence only six stars in the Subaru logo. But who do you think the invisible sister is? The Witch of Envy? Maybe? I don't know. But, you know, there's like, you know, Witch of Envy consumed all the other six witches and reigned terror, which turns, inspires the logo and alludes to the companies that merged to create, you know, the fucking, uh, I don't know, the Subaru logo, right? Seven sisters. Real subtle, Tepe, mm -hmm. real subtle. So astronomy definitely plays a big role in terms Absolutely of plot significance, do. and it's currently one of the biggest mysteries in ReZero. I think these are just more evidence to suggest that there is definitely um, Beyond the Great Waterfall, which is alluding to another world, which could be Japan. Maybe not even Japan specifically, but um, why would Pandora know it? There's somehow more meaning beyond the world, right? In the existence of that fucking basketball in Amelia's room too, that's just very suspicious. Like, I could maybe assume that Hoshino the Wilderness uh, brought the influence of basketball into this Isekai world because he's a fucking ball is life, but I don't think so. I think there's something else going on here. Regulus 2 is named after a star. Regulus mm. can disarm people without even moving, and he's literally immune to- Did he not move, though? Did, didn't he use his, like, a hand motion against Krush and Bet and Betrigus? Didn't the kidnap literally tell tell us that, like, the way that his power- No, that was Annie news. Like, something about, like, a space above him being, like, almost, like, being crushed into fucking nothing. I don't know, like, sounds like he's, like, cutting out the space there, and then somehow Krush's arm is also fucking- psh can disarm people without even moving and he's literally immune to damage. Krush's attack at the beginning of season 2 was confirmed to be just as powerful as her attack that decimated the white whale in season 1, but Regulus was of course unaffected. The unique thing about Regulus as a villain is that he doesn't have any large scale evil agendas or anything like that. He, he just chilling. Him even showing up where Krush and Rem was by coincidence, only Gluttony was there on purpose. Regulus was just chilling. He's literally just a selfish, egotistical dickhead who's been blessed with an extraordinarily overpowered ability uh -huh. for no reason. Imagine if Kazuma had the powers of Reinhardt. That's that would be hilarious. Would Kazuma? And then if Kazuma become very corrupted, could he then turn into Regulus later? I don't know, but like, yeah. And, and there's like extra context of like Regulus as a personality. He's a very like, he's almost like a fucking toddler in like the tantrums he throws, right? So you're giving this, like, spoiled child, like, the powers of God. Now he just power tripping like crazy. It's basically Regulus for you. And now that I mention it, Regulus also yearns for true gender equality. <laughs> Man? <laughs> what is that, Akinna? Tell me Wait, the powers. He's wearing jewelry. His mm. outfit is fresh as fuck. And mm. he's married to multiple women. Yeah. That about confirms it, guys. Regulus what? is a pimp. pimp -a -job, baby. I mean, maybe he... Operate a brothel, who knows? In contrast to the first episode of season 2, I thought they did a much better job. Now let's go back to some other stuff. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Is there anything else he showed us? Wait a minute. He's Greed, Eye Color, Archbishop, Greed, Leo. Greed is also known as Average Stupidity, blah, 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 Yeah, yeah, whatever. He's wearing jewelry. Anything else? His outfit is fresh. Was there anything about Leo? Or like the... What was it? 
He's literally just a selfish, egotistical dickhead who's been blessed with an extraordinarily overpowered ability yes. for no reason. About Regulus and Whale and see you Hold up. He's literally over at the power of I guess I'm, I don't know where that one went. Maybe it was the Constellations one. I just wanted to see what Leo is. I'll read it on my own time. But one more time, the more I think about it, how about this? Uh, the theory for Regulus's powers? Let's think about thematically greed. I don't know if trying to convey themes of the sin and an authority really makes sense because an invisible hand, how is that fucking like slothful? Someone had a very interesting headcanon theory about how the reason why an authority should change to a person's personality and desires, right? That's confirmed, yet Subaru, Better Goose, and Sekhmet seemingly all has invisible hands is because... The authority itself is lazy as fuck. It's very slothful. It doesn't want to change. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, I'm willing to entertain the thought. It's pretty funny to me. And if it is the case, then damn, you're a fucking genius. Like, think about that. It's, it's just very like, yeah, no, I can't be bothered to change. I'm just going to be the same fucking hand every time. <laughs> I'm down. That's a meme theory. Um, for this one, let's try to incorporate greed into it. Someone who's so greedy uh, should assume that everything belongs to them. Almost like Gilgamesh and Fate Zero, right? And the other Fates, I guess, too. Regulus touching the dust here, and he, suddenly the dust is now his, right? The authority of greed is now the fucking... Uh, uh, now he controls everything about this dust, all the fucking particles, and then just, just fucking rips, you know, Pandora to shreds. Now, why was there examples of the dust being shown in these examples? And, you know, Regulus didn't even need the dust to cut off Crucia's arms because I feel like that still has to do with, like, wind or some shit. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out, like, whatever he touches, he just has absolute authority over it to the point he can just change this shit into fucking bullet-like missiles and go into her and just fucking shred her apart. Also, there seems to be a kink with uh, lollies getting brutalized because this is not the first time that Pandora just gets completely brutalized like this. I, I think that this is a gore uh, kink being at display here. Two examples, right, where the lolly just got brutalized, so not a pattern of behavior. It is a pattern of behavior now. Wait a minute. He's wearing jewelry. His yep. outfit is fresh as fuck. Pimp. And he's married to multiple women. That about confirms it, guys. Regulus is a pimp. In contrast to the first episode of season two, I thought they did a much better job including more Regulus dialogue, but as always, there was a bit of cut content. Mm. According to Regulus himself, he's more powerful than both the Sword Saint and the Dragon. Nah, he capping. He capping, right? Nah, you gotta, you gotta, you get, Twitter fucking gonna get a, what's it called? Fuck. What happens when you... Spread some misinformation on Twitter, and then you get com community noted, right? Yeah, you're gonna get a community note for this shit. I think he might have been exaggerating just a bit, but the author has confirmed Regulus to be the strongest Archbishop, and even more powerful than most of the witches. But the re- Damn. Because I don't know the power scaling between the witches and the Archbishops, but... Uh, Sekhmet is super, super strong, right? I wonder... So, maybe I'll put Regulus right below Sekhmet? So stronger than like, because like Sekhmet's super strong, Satellus at the very top at like Reinhardt tier right. Maybe I put Regulus right underneath Sekhmet? I don't know. But the reason Pandora's introduction was so impactful is actually because of Regulus. Most of this episode was spent building up his power to establish him as an indestructible apocalyptic villain. Mm -hmm. Only for Pandora to make all that build up irrelevant. Simply- That's crazy though, huh? Like, reg from us, it's like, Regulus is so powerful, Regulus is so powerful, and then, this child literally just makes a fool of Regulus, and just, re just removes him. Straight up just removes him. All that build up irrelevant, simply by uttering a few words. The way his disappearance cuts him off mid-sentence combined- Regulus is stronger than Sekhmet in a Q&A by Tape? Damn. So only Satala? And, and the Witch of Vanity, who knows where the fuck she is placed there, but that's crazy. Find with the lingering OST truly made it feel like reality had just corrected an error. The revelation of Pandora's power was perfectly executed, and it Script left writer. behind a sense of inevitable dread. So if Juice and Fortuna were smart, they would Naruto run the fuck away. Also I, lo I love how much Naruto running there... 
Jesus Christ, this design is insane. <laughs> she just wears fucking nothing. She just commando, just has a fucking poncho, but the Naruto runs are crazy. Fuck away. Also, Pandora doesn't wear any pantsu, so mm. hopefully. Yeah, that, that angle, that, that, that angle, yeah, that angle. Regulus's eyes didn't Jesus. deceive him. Pandora became a lot scarier to me when I saw that Regulus, of all people, initially respect addressed her. her with respect. Exactly. And, and another crazy thing is. Regulus is the guy that was sent to the Valachian Empire to destroy a city due to a different witch that wasn't the Witch of Envy gaining clout. But we have another witch here, the Witch of Vanity. How the fuck does that make sense? This cult, this witch's cult, only exists to serve the Witch of Envy. Yet, Pandora is here, meaning that she is not part of the other witch. Like she, I don't know, because her goal seems to be also with releasing the Witch of Envy somehow, is my assumption. Therefore... Pandora is fine, but everyone else is not. Who knows? He addressed her with respect. And when Fortuna implied that she was responsible for whatever happened to Amelia's parents, mm -hmm. I couldn't help but question how- It seems like, based on the dialogue, that Pandora killed the parents, right? Why would Pandora, you know, say, eat all these ice skewers and apologize to my brother and his wife? It, it sounds like she was intending to send, you know, Pandora to fucking hell. Or to the afterlife. Implications, right? Just assumptions. Can't help but question how Pandora was the only witch to survive Satella's rampage 400 years ago. Who knows? Pandora. Well, she can reality bend. That's probably helpful. But the witch of vanity appears to be the leader of the witch cult, the hidden orchestrator of many of the world's tragedies, and quite possibly the final boss of this anime. Could be, right? Could be. I'm not. I guess I'm not uh, holding out on the Witch of Melancholy to exist because that was another sin along with vanity or vainglory that existed before these seven sins. But it's looking like she is the top dog right now. If we look at like the the ranking charts of respecting people, hierarchies, powers. With her introduction, we're finally able to picture the end game of Re Zero. Before this episode, the path was unclear, but now I can say with confidence that ReZero is going to be the story of Natsuki Subaru's journey, collecting all the witch factors mm -hmm. to eventually defeat Pandora. Yes, exactly right. Collecting all the witch factors. Why? Because he's the uniter, Pleiades, right? And he seemingly already has the witch of Envy's, um, well, the authority of Envy. Maybe he's using it by a proxy. I don't know if he actually has, like, the witch factor of Envy. He probably does, right? I, I think it's pretty much... Imp it's not confer Roswell said it, right? But again, with Razor, you never know. But I'm assuming he has two right now. He's going to collect all of it. Collect all the Dragon Balls. Become powerful enough. Beat Pandora. I don't know. ...to eventually defeat Pandora and save Satella. Before I talk more about Pandora, though, I know a lot of anime onlys are probably asking the following questions. Yeah. Is she a lolly? Absolutely. Lollies are not determined by age, but simply by body type to me. I don't give a fuck if she's 9,000 years old. She looks like a petite girl that hasn't even hit puberty yet. That is a lolly in my definition. Probably asking the following questions. Is she a lolly? And can we loot her? To which the answers are- Listen. Also, it's funny that an appa is here. So, the, appa, the forbidden appa theory is actually coming true in this situation too. Anytime you have the presence of an oppa, something bad's gonna happen. And the bad thing happening is the question of, can we loot her? My take with lollicons, people that enjoy lolly shit. I don't think you're a pedo. I don't think this is CP. No, you need to actually do the fucking act in real life. And hell no, you should never fucking do that. That's heinous. You're gonna go to fucking jail. You deserve a special place in hell for that. But certainly people getting horny off of arts, off of prepubescent children is not a good look either, right? I don't think that all lollicons are pedos. No. But I think that most pedos are lollies. I think there definitely is a connection of people that would do such acts and having an attraction to art depicting those kind of victims. 100%. That's just pure logic. Loot her. To which the answers are yes and immediately. She was described in the novels as someone so beautiful that even God would hesitate to touch her. And I feel like I've <laughs> even made this God. joke before, but it's a good thing I'm not God. Speaking of God... <laughs> I haven't heard that joke before. Though it looks like Pandora might have taken his powers. Reality itself seems to obey her as she rewrites phenomena however she wishes yeah. to. But She's a script writer. For a second, her power has to have some type of limitation because. Well, yeah, because like if she, if her goal is the seal, 
And she could just say, the seal will appear in front of me and become unlocked. But she clearly needs the key, right? She can't just brute force this. There's some limitations here. She can send Regulus home, but can't just do this. Obviously, if she could just snap her fingers and get whatever she wants, there wouldn't be any conflict or any story. Pandora would just win immediately and we'd have no way of stopping her. So the simple fact that she wants to open the seal, but hasn't done so already. Well, maybe there is some um, implication here that yes, she can rewrite the script. But if it's belonging to this world, we know that this place, this domain, this is not part of the world. This area in the forest is separate. It doesn't abide by the same laws. So I think that makes sense. If we're trying to think about why can't Pandora just do whatever she wants with the seal here. And maybe the seal is intentionally placed here because the people know that Pandora is fucking broken. And we need to place it separately from the laws of this world. Okay, I'm going to do that. Ah shit, I clicked away. Uh, where were we? Where were we? Over here. She wants to open the seal, but hasn't done so already. Implies that her power wasn't enough. Besides. What was this little frame? It was solemn, holy, a space exempt for the light. <laughs> this motherfucker inserted this frame. Fucking one frame, bro. One fucking frame because he didn't want... Because obviously now what I theorize is true. Because a kid nut has read ahead. He knows the source material. But he doesn't want to spoil the anime only. And if he give this passage, it's too easy. So he'll fucking blink. He'll flash it for like a fraction of a fucking second. <sighs> Her power wasn't enough. Aside from that, she's also the most dangerous villain we've seen thus far. With the death of Juice and the birth of Petal Goose, Pandora seized full control of the witch cult, and that's most likely the reason it became what it is today. Mmm. More radicalizations, right? Yeah. Because Pandora's ultimate goal is to... It sounded like, based on what she said, like, if we get to the seal and unlock it, then, like, we can, like, um... I forget the exact passage, but I think there was an implications of like, now we can actually finish her job. Like half the world that was flattened by the Witch of Envy before, and then she got sealed away. Now, can, now we can like fucking finish something. I don't know. She just wants the destruction of the world. That sounds pretty stupid, right? I'm evil because I'm evil. What could her motivations be? Well, actually, if you think about it from the Annie News Cut content, what is Pandora's personality? Um, well, we thought that maybe she is this person that is so foreign to the concept of humanity that she doesn't know what human emotions are. And by seeing Juice and Fortuna, you know, if just struggle to survive and live out their dreams, right? That pursuit was like love, like human emotions. And she saw that and she's crying because she's like, oh, now I see how you ants actually feel. I want to be able to, I want to understand you people. Now, when I say human, that's not really accurate, right? Because Juice is like a spirit, Fortune is like an elf, but you know, non-witch living beings, like how they suffer and struggle and love and all these different emotions that Pandora is like foreign to, but then it was then followed up by, maybe she's just a sadist and she just wanted people to suffer. And if we go with that line of thinking, then her just wanting to destroy the world for the sake of destroying the world, I guess that just makes sense. I wasn't particularly impressed by the effects they used for the Black Serpent, but the amputation scene was really well done. This combination of wind and water magic was really hardcore, especially when you realize why Archie did it. He understood he was a dead man, yet he mm. amputated his leg anyway Anyways. because he didn't want Amelia to have to watch him die. Well, he's still fucking... I, I guess it slowed it down. I, I, I guess it slowed it down. Because, like, the implication here is that even though he cut off clean before the, this corrosion stuff hit, like, it still carried on after he froze this separate limb that was seemingly was healthy. So if the serpent fucking venom hits you once, you're fucking cooked. But damn, Archie. Realize why Archie did it. He understood he was a dead man, yet he amputated his leg anyway because he didn't want Amelia to have to watch him die. He prolonged his life solely with the purpose of protecting her, which mm. I thought was very admirable. As we know, the three great mob beasts were created- ah! Do you watch it again? I saw- I, I saw something. I saw the black- I, I, I saw a frame of the black shirt. Should, we, should, we, should, we can click it, right? You wanna see it again? It looks like a fucking sandworm. I just saw the, the head of it. Should we click it? Should we? Should we? 
I mean, why not? I want to see it. It's just a snake. Fuck it. So the three great mods. Okay, okay, okay. Well, here's the actual. Well, is it an actual design, though? This shit looks like it's from Dune, bro. Like a sandworm. Fucking shy hulud. Beasts were created by Daphne to rid the world of starvation. The white whale was large enough to feed an entire city for months. That's right. The rabbit infinitely re in just reproduce, just like, you know, uh, copies itself and you can eat food. And then the third, the snake. How does the snake help? <laughs> it calls the population, I guess. Less mouths to feed. Genius. Thank you, Daphne. The great rabbit can multiply indefinitely, allowing it to provide more food than one could possibly need. Yeah. But the black serpent is poisonous. If Daphne didn't want people to go hungry, why didn't she make the black serpent edible? But you can't fucking go hungry if you're dead. Duh. The answer is simple. Its purpose was to rid the world of starvation by getting rid of everything capable of starving. It was... But the logic was he wanted to prevent the people from suffering from starvation, which implies death, right? If you starve and you suffer and you die, but... I guess the important thing is avoiding the starvation, right? If you can't starve, if you're fucking dead, baby! It was meant to kill us, not feed us. Also, she is a, t she is a fucking child. She is a literal child. So I don't expect her to have insane intelligence. Plus, she's a witch on top of that. She's a child witch. I think it makes sense why she would think like this. ...of starving. It was meant to kill us not feed us. According to the author, the Black Serpent is the most powerful of the oh, three great mobbies. The power they also scaling. called it the most troublesome, likely because most of its destruction is indirect. Compared to the other two, it's not as active, but whenever it moves, it curses the ground it travels upon, corrupting the land so that nothing except petrification, rotting, behind viruses, and the land doesn't move. Other mob beasts can live on it. The Black Corrupt to the other two, it's not as active, but whenever it moves, it curses the ground it travels yep. upon, corrupting- Now when you say curse, is that an actual thing? Because like, we know that curses exist. We don't have much cursed users that we've seen. But maybe if there's like a possible- I don't know, maybe, maybe- I'm just trying to think of ways to like, purify this curse, but maybe it's impossible. ...the land so that nothing except other mob beasts can live on it. The black water from the Frozen Bonds OVA was actually the frozen remnants of the poison the Black Serpent left behind this episode. Ah, that's right, right? Because Melaquera like unsealed it, right? And I'm gonna assume that this uh, pre-Frozen Bond stuff comes to a halt when Amelia goes berserk and freezes everything, including the snake, so... But like... That's just a venom. Where is the snake? What a secret, huh? We've never seen the snake. The serpent. All we see is the, the fucking... I'm not sure if it's accurate to call it the venom or the poison, but I'm gonna continue calling it venom because it sounds cool. But the venom is like sentient and moves around, and it, who knows how many other fucking blobs of venom exist. Where is the fucking serpent right now? Who knows? So theoretically, if the black serpent isn't stopped, it'll continue spreading corruption throughout the land until nothing's left. So right now, Elior Forest is just cooked. Right? Because like... What happened to this shit at the end of Frozen Bomb? The more I think about it, I, I don't know. I actually don't remember. All I remember is the fight between Puck and Melaquera and then Puck making a contract with Amelia. The Venom shit, did Amelia freeze it again? I'm not sure, but something about thawing the people, like... I'm not sure if I'm crazy, but is there potentially, uh, like... The goal for Amelia is to unfreeze the people of Elior Forest, right? But do you think that there's a possibility that it's a cruel thing of if you, if you thaw everyone out, the snake also gets thawed out, like it's here somewhere? <laughs> like, like, the only way, like the only way to save the people of Elior Forest is by releasing the fucking serpent out into the world? Wouldn't that be kind of crazy? We didn't get to see much of it this episode, but the early sanctuary has a very interesting history. We got to see a younger Roswell, Roswell who has Mathers? two blue eyes in contrast. True, two blue eyes. Didn't even see that. The eye color, right? Because Roswell L. Mathers has two separate colors. Okay. Roswell, who has two blue eyes in contrast to the current Roswell's heterochromia. I so I wonder who... Okay, yellow eye is important. There's this golden... 
Regulus kind of has that eye. Oh my god, guys. Yeah. Okay, here's the theory. Roswell's ancestor, who is a girl, fucked Regulus. And Roswell L. Mathers has blue and gold eyes now. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. See a younger Roswell who has two blue eyes in contrast to the current Roswell. Makes a lot of sense to me. I'd also like to mention that Roswell in the flashback is 16 years old. I just felt like some of us could use a reminder, that's all. <laughs> a kid that died at 19. Right, so I'm gonna assume the kid that the current flashback is 19 and Roswell is 16. The flashback is 16 years old. I just felt like some of us could use a reminder, that's all. In Ryuzu's flashback, some of us could use a reminder, that's all. Motherfucker. <laughs> Motherfucker, you literally had this. <laughs> you gonna say that shit after you do this? Surely you're not gonna fucking hide behind a number, a fucking arbitrary number just placed on, you know, Pandora and say, well, Pandora's now 16, so it's fine. Sure. Sure. Where are we? blue eyes in contrast to the current Roswell's heterochromia. I'd also like to mention that Roswell in the flashback is 16 years old. I just felt like some of us could use a reminder, that's mm -hmm. all. In Ryuzu's flashback, we learned that although she's a lolly herself, she was also Pico. a lolly con simultaneously. I can't really blame her. That's true. Ryuzu is a lolly con. Lolly con, lolly Because no, it was a rather stunning shot of Beatrice. The mm -hmm. art and direction of these new episodes have been outstanding so far and a big improvement over the first course. So I gotta 10. give credit where it's due. 10 out of 10. It's finally confirmed that Beatrice is Echidna's daughter. Yep. Obviously. Meaning that Puck could be Echidna's son, right? Could be. Obviously not biologically, as Beatrice is a spirit and Echidna is a human, though it does. I don't think she literally birthed Biku out of her womb, but she's like, it's more like I created Biku from her mother, figuratively, right? Feel kind of weird to call her a human. But the reason Biku's design looks like it belongs in a children's book is because Echidna wanted her to look that way. We don't know <laughs> how Echidna created her. It could have been okay. some forgotten magic or even her authority of greed. Nobody really knows. Yeah, what the fuck is her authority of greed? We haven't really seen it yet, right? And like... Like, how does how, how? I have no clue. Because, like, I'm thinking about Sekhmet and I'm thinking of Betrigus and Subaru. That shit makes sense, right? They all have a similar power. But we're known that the authorities change on a person's personality and desires. And maybe there's some core themes that get carried over, but each skill is different. I'm not sure. And then we go with the theory that sloth authority is so fucking lazy that it never changed. Now, authority of greed and creating a spirits. Well, if we assume that somehow Regulus. My assumption is whatever he fucking touches, he just assumes that, like, maybe he doesn't need to even touch it, but, like, everything is his, and he can fucking control it to an atomic level, and therefore Echidna, too, can control shit to an atomic level, and can create spirits. I don't know, I'm trying to really do mental gymnastics here, man. I don't know. What's important is that we know Biako is Echidna's daughter. And although Biako's mother is best girl, Biako herself does belong in the highest of tiers. And I wow, Echidna's... Okay. He really loves... That's a solid roster, bro. Roswell and Betrigus both being an S tier. <laughs> Subaru default. Yeah, obviously, right? I mean, it's, he's a fucking main character and he... Goes over so much hard shit and overcomes them. Rem, absolutely. Biko, Al. Al also there, man. That's pretty fucking amazing. ...belong in the highest of tiers. And after this episode, I think we can all agree that Biko must be protected at yes. all costs. Yes. So let's hope that Subaru will use protection. Beatrice was also well... Some of you need to be reminded once again. ...acquainted with Juice, as was confirmed in this week's break time. Juice. The reason Juice was alive 400 years ago he's is a because spirit. he's a spirit. That's so right. Juice or Betelgeuse was surprisingly one of the oldest characters in ReZero. And I'm starting to think we probably shouldn't have killed him. <laughs> what, what are we supposed to do, bro? What are we supposed to do? It's... Okay, uh, my tinfoil theory, just because I want Betrigus to come back. All right, think of it like this, all right? Think of it like this. I believe, and you can laugh at me all you want, I want to believe that Betrugis' soul is not destroyed. And a fragment of it is somehow within Subaru right now. 
And maybe there will come a moment where Subaru is able to channel the inner Betteru Goose. And through Betteru Goose's help, Subaru can use his authority even better. And he's back and everyone's happy and Subaru's phasing. I don't fucking know. I'm trying to figure out a way how Betteru Goose can return to the story other than in flashbacks. But wah wah. We probably shouldn't have killed him. Was his sanity truly irretrievable? It's impossible to tell, but Biako's heartbroken reaction upon learning of his death finally makes a lot more sense now. Mm -hmm. Biako's interactions with Ryuzu are, for lack of a better term, fucking so adorable. There was a shop exclusive side story that added a bit to the pre sanctuary storyline oh? and explained in further detail how Echidna saved Roswell and helped him realize his magical talents. There was also saved. a cute interaction where Roswell tells Beatrice he loves her and then she tries to attack him and chase <laughs> They never get along. Well, the current L Mathers. I, well, I'm gonna assume every Roswell is fucking the same, but you know, it's it's, it's cute. You know, back in the day. This is him all around the sanctuary. But Echidna, while sipping her tea and watching them, mutters to herself, calling them brother and sister. Whether so, she assumes Roswell to be her son. Whether that was meant to be taken literally is beyond the limits of my knowledge. But I thought classic reason shit where everything is riddled in assumptions bro ah what does that mean I thought it would be worth mentioning nonetheless these happy peaceful days of the early sanctuary were so refreshing and wholesome i almost forgot what anime i was watching luckily Pan remember slice of life moment a life is about to get sliced these peaceful moments don't last for too long and dora showed up just in time to remind me what re is all about suffering the music was very on point this episode, and I love how the ending sounded so hopeful as if the episode was going to end on a positive note only for Pandora to once again remind us how fucked we really are. Even the break time episode was amazing, and I'm willing to bet a lot of novel readers didn't even know Echidna used to live in a floating blah, 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 castle, blah, 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 blah. so I'm really happy they're actually using break time to promote yep, the definitely lore didn't see that. Zero. And yes, it is canon, although maybe not the part where Beatrice was reading Kono- <laughs> You wanna see what Japanese? This is Konosuba, bro. Suba. This episode gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Classic. The highlight was probably the revelation of Pandora's authority. I really felt like Juice and Fortuna were right there reacting to it along with me. And another good scene was Fortuna's goodbye to Amelia. Really heartbreaking moment, full of emotion. Just a really great episode overall. Wait, not just yet though. I don't think Fortuna's just done yet because this bitch still got the fucking hair clip, bro. Amelia gets that hair coat later, so no, 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 no. Fortuna gonna show up again next episode, just for a bit, I think. Full of emotion, just a really great episode overall. A lot of people said they didn't like Pandora's VA, but I thought the voice fit her well. Yeah, I mean, I saw Pandora's design. Like this translucent, shiny fucking lolly. And her entire personality, the voice acting, it just fits her. It just sounds like someone, I mean, it's got that lolly voice. Not in like a super cute way. But it's like a very, like, omnipotent lolly. The scary lolly. Someone that just, it's like a soothing voice, but kind of scary because it feels like they know it all. Like they could just control whatever they want kind of voice. VA, but I thought the voice fit her well. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like to yes, support sir. me. Yes, sir. Once again, please follow me on Twitter. Yes, sir. Here. Here's the link, guys. Please go give Mr. Echidna's video a like. And what do we learn from this? Other than from any use cut content? Uh, more, I mean, reminder of the constellations and Pandora knowing, you know, better use, right? And it's like, oh, what the fuck? You know, is there more theories how the seal could relate to the outside world? And more of like why the seal and the lock cannot be abused by Pandora because this whole domain is, you know, it's not bound to the laws of the world that exists around it. Um, Regulus' power shit? I still don't fucking know. Feel like it just feels like his authority just lets him control these fucking dust particles. The only reason that he used dust here instead of just using wind was that the dust could then just be... I don't know, you actually have physical particles that you can attack with like bullets rather than just winds. I don't know if I'm fucking coping. Um, there was the constellation shit. The actual lore of Vainglory being the progenitor of Witch of Envy is pretty interesting. And now maybe we have pieced together that... Uh, the Witch of Vainglory simply wants to see the world burn and get destroyed because at the end of the day, she is just a fucking sadist and that kind of like makes sense with her lore. Who knows, but that's it from me. I'll see you next time.